Even in the twilight of its glory, the realm of Gondor was still one of the greatest factions in all the lands of Middle-earth, for by the end of the Third Age, it mainly fell upon them to lead the resistance against Sauron. Their lands were constantly threatened with war, from Mordor or some other allies of Sauron, and so the Kingdom of Gondor had to prepare an elaborate defensive plan to increase their chance of victory and to ensure their survival. In today's episode, we'll be breaking down the battle plans of Gondor and all of the defences that they had in place. So by the end of the Third Age, Gondor had fallen into decay and it was a shadow of its former glory. Its people had to endure a plague, a civil war and orc and easterlings attacks. And over the years, Gondor's borders slowly shrunk as they lost their fortress of Kirith Ungol, the Black Gate, and even the land of Athelion to Sauron's forces. Their once ancient capital of Osgiliath lay in ruins, and by the time of the War of the Ring, only its western half was controlled by Gondor, for its eastern half had fallen under Mordor's shadow. Now, it's essential that before we explore Gondor's defensive layout, we must understand its overall strategy, since they had to, obviously, complement each other. The lands of Gondor were vast, and most of its people lived far away from Minas Tirith, in the regions of Lebanon, the Sarnak, Belfalas, and the Blackroot Vale. And Minas Tirith would call out to these regions for reinforcements when it was faced with a dire threat. This was actually why the beacon system was created, for it allowed Minas Tirith to quickly send out a cry of help to the other regions of Gondor that were thousands of miles away, so that they could prepare to send reinforcements in a timely manner. Unlike what is seen in the movies, these beacons weren't meant for Rohan, for Gondor used another method to summon the Rohirrim to war by sending out a messenger armed with a unique artifact called the Red Arrow. Now, as you can see from this map, there is an obvious problem with the lands of Gondor, for most of them were much further away from Minas Tirith than Mordor itself. And so by the time any reinforcements could be sent to Minas Tirith, it's possible that Sauron's forces could have already marched out and encircled the city. This is why Gondor's defences were spread out across four layers, and each one of these layers shared the common goal of slowing down the enemy's movement and delaying their progress, so that Minas Tirith could buy enough time for the arrival of its reinforcements and allies. It's unfortunate that during the War of the Ring, Sauron preempted that Gondor would summon all of its warriors to Minas Tirith, and so he ordered the Corsairs to harass and attack the western regions of Gondor, which significantly limited the number of reinforcements that Minas Tirith could receive from those lands. For example, we see how Minas Tirith expected over 2,000 reinforcements from the Sarnak, though they were only able to spare 200 men instead. So the outermost defense of Gondor was also its most mobile offensive unit, and it came in the form of the Rangers of Athelion. These rangers wandered across the land of Athelion, and it was their job to wear down and harass Sauron's armies. They were skilled in the art of camouflage and guerrilla warfare, and they had hidden bases scattered throughout the land of Athelion. As a small unit, they couldn't face the armies of Mordor in open battle, but instead they took advantage in their knowledge of the land to lay out ambushes and to wear down their enemy with hit-and-run tactics. These tactics were highly effective against patrols and small armies, though the rangers could do little against large forces, in which case they would retreat back to the next line of defence, such as joining and helping out the garrison of Osgiliath. Now even though Osgiliath formed a part of Gondor's second defensive front, 
it was only a small component, and it would be more accurate to see the entire River Anduin as the main defensive line. This river was a natural barrier, and it was impossible for Sauron's armies to cross it in a timely manner without needing many boats, which wasn't very feasible. Time is a crucial resource when it comes to sieges, because armies need to be resupplied with food, and it would be hard to sustain these supply lines across the river. It could put the entire operation at risk if something had to go wrong. Sauron's armies would be forced to use one of two passages to cross this river, either through the northern passage by crossing the island of Ker Andros, or through the southern passage by travelling across the bridge of Osgiliath. Both of these passages were vital to Gondor's defence, for if Ker Andros had to fall, Sauron's armies could sweep through Gondor's northern lands and intercept the riders of Rohan before they could reach Minas Tirith, while Osgiliath was the perfect defence to repel Gondor's enemies, especially if the Gondorians were outnumbered, for they could force the orcs into its narrow passages, forming choke points, and this would give the men of Gondor an opportunity to inflict heavy casualties upon their enemies. Gondor only controlled the western half of Osgiliath, for its eastern half had fallen into the hands of Mordor a year prior to the War of the Ring. Luckily, they had managed to destroy the bridge that connected the two parts of the city, and so Sauron's armies would have no choice but to use boats to cross into the western half. Apart from being a logistical nightmare, these boats were easy targets for the archers of Gondor, and they would have provided the orcs with very little cover which made them extremely vulnerable during the crossing. It might seem like Osgiliath was a much more difficult passage compared to Ker Andros, and on a superficial level this is true, for Osgiliath could put up a much stronger defence than Ker Andros, and Sauron's armies would suffer many more casualties trying to breach through its defences. However, it's important to keep in mind that Sauron had hundreds of thousands of orcs at his command, and he saw them as a disposable resource. He didn't care how many orcs died, he had plenty to replace them. However, as we mentioned earlier, time was much more crucial. If Sauron had to send out the vast majority of his armies to cross Ker Andros, the supply lines would have again been a nightmare since it was quite a detour from Minas Morgul, and it would have also given Gondor more time to summon its reinforcements and allies. If Osgiliath had to fall, you might think that its garrison would face a massacre as they tried to retreat back to Minas Tirith, for nothing would stop the orcs from cutting them down. But Gondor was in fact prepared for such a calamity. This is why they built the next line of defence called the Ramas Ikor, which was a massive wall that encircled the Pelennor fields, and its strongest fortifications faced the bridge of Osgiliath. This part of the wall was particularly high and strong, with towers beside the gate, and it was known as the Causeway Fort. Its purpose was to provide the garrison of Osgiliath with cover as they fell back from the battlefield and it also had wagons stationed within its walls to carry any wounded soldiers of Gondor to Minas Tirith, where their wounds could be cared for in the Houses of Healing. This wall had three gates in total, located at its northern, eastern and southern tips, and apart from buying time for Gondor's armies to retreat across the vast plains of the Pelennor fields, it also gave them another chance to inflict significant casualties upon their enemies. However, its size made it too large to hold off the enemy for long, as the Gondorian garrison would be spread out too thin, and it was expected that the Ramas Ikor would eventually be breached. We see this happening during the War of the Ring, when the orcs blasted through several parts of the wall, and so its garrison had to retreat back to the walls of Minas Tirith. In order to prevent the orcs from overwhelming them, Faramir decided to lead the rear guard to cover this retreat, and thanks to his bravery and leadership, 
two-thirds of the Gondorian garrison managed to make its way back to Minas Tirith. It's hard to say whether this was part of Gondor's official battle strategy, though I believe it's worth mentioning. After the orcs breached the Ramas Ikor, they chased after Faramir's unit, and this left them exposed to a cavalry counterattack, and it led to devastating losses for the orc forces. This was only possible because the orc army was forced to pass through the narrow breaches within the Ramas Ikor and they ended up stretching their forces thin, which left them vulnerable. Now we come to the final and greatest of Gondor's defences, the city of Minas Tirith. This city had an incredible defensive structure, for it was carved out of the mountain called Mindolwin, and so it only had to worry about attacks that came from its front. It had seven levels in total, and each level was protected with a strong wall. They were built in such a way that to climb up to the next level, one would have to walk to the opposite side of the city to find the next gate, and this would force Gondor's enemies to push through tight streets as they zigzagged through the levels. This would leave them exhausted from the climb, and with each level, they would have to face and breach another gate, while they were constantly bombarded with arrows from the levels above. The height difference would also give the Gondorian archers a massive advantage, for it was much easier and safer to rain down missiles when you have the high ground, and it also allowed the Gondorian garrison to retreat to a higher point and reorganize their strength behind the next gate if it seemed like their level was lost to the enemy. Normally, when Gondor wasn't besieged, a password would be required to get past each of the gates and to access a different level of this city, and I imagine that this helped to maintain order and security within its walls. The outer and main wall of Minas Tirith was the greatest of them all, and it was different to all the others, for it was built out of a strange black stone, similar to that of the Tower of Orthanc and this stone was said to be unconquerable and unbreakable by steel or fire. So the only way to breach it into the first level of Minas Tirith was by breaking through the gate, which was still an intimidating task, for it was made out of sturdy steel and iron and guarded by towers. Gondor was well aware that the main gate of Minas Tirith was a glaring weak spot and the most likely to be breached, and so they decided to keep their greatest and hardiest warriors, such as the Knights of Dol Amroth, stationed behind this gate, so that they would be ready to hold back any breach. The Masons of Gondor had also set up trebuchets upon its walls, so that they could reach out and destroy any of Mordor's siege equipment, such as their battering rams and siege towers, before they could reach the walls. Historically, this sort of trebuchet wasn't used to target infantry, perhaps because they were more effective against large targets, and we actually see how some of these trebuchets managed to bring down some of the Mumakil. Apart from its main gate, there was also another technical weak spot in Minas Tirith's defence, though it was quite insignificant and impractical for large armies to make use of it. At the fifth level, there was a narrow passage that connected the mountain Mindolwin to Minas Tirith, and so enemies could technically climb up and scale this mountain, and thereby breach the upper levels of the city. However, once again we must keep in mind that this was approximately 500 feet high, and Gondor had actually built great ramparts to prevent any enemies from doing so. No matter how strong or impregnable a fortress may be, it's not much use if it's not able to store or maintain the necessary supplies to withstand a siege and feed its people. The Lords of Gondor knew that they couldn't really grow food in Minas Tirith, and so they would have to have an efficient system in place to ensure that they didn't run out of supplies. First of all, the Pelennor Fields were an incredibly fertile piece of land, thanks to the River Anduin and they were filled with farms, orchards, and homesteads. Some of their harvest was probably stored in Minas Tirith, 
which would prolong its survival when besieged. Minas Tirith would also send out the vast majority of its people that were unable to fight, such as the women and children, to its safer lands in the west, and this allowed it to be very efficient with its stored supplies, for there would be many less mouths to feed, and it obviously also had the additional benefit of keeping the rest of Gondor's people safe. Considering the size of Minas Tirith, it was of the utmost importance that the commanders or rulers of Gondor were able to send out their commands quickly to the lower levels of the city, so that they could react in a swift manner to any changes upon the battlefield. Stables were kept in the sixth circle of the city, so that messengers could ride down to the lower levels bearing new instructions. Apart from these horses, there weren't many cavalry units among the forces of Minas Tirith, for they seemed to rely heavily on infantry instead. It's also worth mentioning that the guards of the citadel could be found at the highest level of the city, and they were an elite group of warriors tasked with protecting the steward or king. These warriors weren't able to leave their station unless they were ordered to do so or given permission. If the worst came to pass and Minas Tirith had to fall, it wouldn't be the end for the last warriors of Minas Tirith or the people that stayed behind, for there were secret passages in the city that could be used to escape into the mountains, and they led to hidden valleys where some of Gondor's people could escape to and find some refuge. So, this wraps up today's video, and we hope you enjoyed it. What do you guys think of Gondor's defensive plan, and is there any way to improve it? And what do you think about Sauron's own attacks, and could he have changed anything in his plans to adapt his armies better to Gondor's defence? As always, we'd like to say thank you to all of the patrons that support the channel. Your help makes the channel possible and your support is deeply appreciated, especially the Valar tier patrons, Jacob Williams, Michael Angel and T. Gorman, and the wizard tier patrons, James Stodgill, Andrew Burma, Mike Feeney and Roland Mervold. If you'd like to help and support the channel while unlocking some cool perks, we'll be leaving a link to the Patreon page in the video description. You can also support the channel by checking out our store and by following us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter and joining our Discord server. All of those links can be found in the video description. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe to join our fellowship today. Until next time, when we will once again explore the magical world and lore of Middle-earth. <laughs>